All right. I think we're live here. Will, thanks for, for joining me. How you doing, man? Pretty good. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, excited for our conversation today to get to learn about kind of one of your passions and hobbies here. Uh, but two things before we do that. One, I need to address everyone who watches this. Just at the conference last week, people are telling me they're watching the videos, but they're not subscribed. So we need to get people subscribed. Uh, so hit the subscribe button, like the video, leave a comment if you like this kind of video. Um, it's a good feedback loop for me to know it's interesting and kind of gives me that energy to, to keep going here. Um, and then the second thing is how I like to start all of my interviews, Will, is I like to play a little game. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> and so uh, what I want to do is, um, given the conversation today around uh, your, your hobby as it is, um, I want to see if you can guess the type of airplane uh, that we have here. So let me zoom in one more. Um, and if you don't know it, I'm not going to check you. Take your best <laughs> guess. <laughs> and maybe someone in the comments will tell us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So a lot of my backgrounds in general aviation. So you're really testing me here. Yeah. Uh, so this first one... I believe it's either a Mitsubishi or a Sukhoi. We're talking about, you know, Asian aircraft here. So a little outside the realm, but I believe it's one of the two. I had no idea Mitsubishi also made airplanes. I don't know how that makes me feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make a TV, make your airliner. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do number two. Number three. Ooh, that I believe is a 757. All right, I believe you. Hey, that's a cool one. Testing me there. I think that's a 737. You were testing me on my airliners. All right, last one, last one. Ooh, and then I think that's an ATR. But I could have just gotten all these wrong. Uh, but, you know, if I get them wrong, then you can kick me off. So Yeah, we'll never know. Uh <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I, as always, I, I appreciate it. Um, well, want to talk today about a little bit about your career, kind of your background, what do you do for work, uh, and then focus a lot of time on you know your your big passion, your big hobby, which is aviation. So you're you're a pilot, uh, and you fly planes, and that's kind of like your your weekend hobby. Yeah, man. So that's you know a lot more fun than probably my uh, my day job. But uh, so yeah, I've been in uh, implementation consulting for I guess about eight years, mostly in the order management space. I had a brief stint working for some crazy guy at this privacy company uh, and then recently have uh, started in a solution engineering role, still in order management. Um, so uh, grew up flying airplanes and, you know, you could either, you know, fly airplanes for a living or uh, you work for a living and uh, pay to feed them. So uh, I guess I took the second route. Yeah, love it. Um Awesome. So uh, let, let's do a little bit of background on kind of education. You're an Alabama guy, went to Auburn, uh, I believe. Um, can you talk about kind of what you studied? And really what I'm interested in is your first job out of school uh, yep. and, and how you landed that gig, because I think that's just an amazing story. Yeah. So uh, so went to college, studied industrial engineering. So actually, um Going into college, I was working on my different uh, flight ratings. So I got my private pilot's license, my instrument rating, uh, my commercial and multi-engine commercial. Um, from there, actually, my uh, summer job in college, I was flying a corporate jet during the summer. Um, and then decided to go a little bit different route after I graduated. Uh, ended up working for uh, a supply chain technology company and their implementation practice. Uh, it was always funny going through the job interview process because on your resume, it was, you know, you used to fly jets and they're like, you know, probably half the companies interviewed at were like, that's really cool. Why would you want to work here? <laughs> so it, it took a little while to find the right fit, but kind of ended up in that area and, you know, enjoyed kind of the engineering and optimization side. Um, definitely a different set of challenges, but still some similarities as well. Yeah, no, I love that. Um and so want to focus today's conversation on the flying, the piloting. So tell me how you got into to flying planes. Um, I think it's a, a family affair. Uh, so can you talk about, you know, growing up, what that looked like? You know, first time you ever uh, flew a plane and, and, you know, really walk me through what it takes to actually become like get your pilot's license. Yeah. 
So I think first time I flew in a plane, I think I was like six weeks old, flew in a Cessna 170. Um, I'm actually a third generation pilot. Um, my dad grew up, uh, or he had with, grew up flying airplanes with his dad, and um, I kind of grew up doing that with him. I always joke and say we didn't hunt golf or fish, but um, flew, flew airplanes along the way. Um, so yeah, I always had an interest in it. Um, always kind of interested in aerobatics as well. Um, then I guess it was around, so to get your license, you can first start soloing at 16. Mm -hmm. uh, so usually you start taking lessons, um, around 15, 16 age. Um, so you're getting lessons before you're like, get your driver's license. Yeah. So you get lessons and then eventually they go, you're good enough not to, you know, hurt yourself. And they sign off your medical certificate and then you can go fly by yourself. You can't take anybody with you. You're just, you know, on your own. Your, your little airplane feels like a 747. Uh, and then once you build up so many hours of, you know, flying by yourself and so many hours of instruction, it's a minimum of 40 hours total. Um, mm. Then you can take a, a written test. Uh, a how how old are you when you're flying by yourself here? 16. Yeah. So I got 16 year olds flying planes above my house is what you're telling me. You, you do. And actually what's even slightly scary is you can actually solo a glider at 14. Uh, so they don't even have an engine and they're, they're flying above you. Probably not in Atlanta, but uh, they're up there. So great, great. Uh, so, you, so you build up that time and then you take a couple different tests and can get your, uh, it's technically called a, a uh, pilot certificate or pilot rating, not a license. There's semantics, but um, you can get your, uh, you can, uh, Get your rating at 17. You can then add on your instrument rating, which allows you to fly in clouds. Uh, and there, from there, you can add on your commercial, which allows you to fly for hire, not at the airline level. Um, and then also in different uh, categories of airplane and classes, um, such mm -hmm. as like a multi-engine airplane. Got it. So there's a kind of progression to fly higher, fly faster. Uh, fly bigger planes as you, you kind of move up, you, you graduate to different tiers there. Yeah. And it's, it's actually, so with like your standard pilot's license, you can fly any non-jet aircraft under 12,500 pounds gross weight. Uh, okay. So most small piston, if it has a propeller, you can probably fly it except for the largest of them. Um, and then past that, you actually get a, more or less a license for that specific aircraft called a type rating. Uh, so, so what's like an aircraft name? Let, let's look one up because I'm not as familiar. So I want to. Yeah. Uh, it. Uh, Cessna 172. It's a classic trainer, four seat, 180 horsepower aircraft. That's the, I think when most people think of a small plane, that's the, that's the go-to. I'm just going to, I'll pull one up here. So if anyone's looking. So this bad boy over here, Cessna 172. Cruises about 130 miles an hour, burns about 10 gallons an hour. And I think they hold about 900, 950 pounds of mm -hmm. payload. Got it. Looks like a four seater or something. Yeah, a, a little bit tighter than your family sedan, but four, <laughs> four seats. <laughs> Two, and then you put some luggage in the back. <laughs> yeah. And then, just for fun, the actual plane I learned in was uh, a 1946 Piper Cub. Um, so it's a tube and fabric, uh, 65 horsepower aircraft. Uh, it's kind of this guy. Used. Yeah, that's that's what <laughs> I really learned. In. Uh, it was it was rebuilt, but um, yeah, that was an old trainer back in back back way in the day. You called it a, a tube and fabric, so it's like fabric outside yeah so it's it's uh it's a steel tube fuselage uh mm -hmm. but then the outside of it is covered in a uh, a fabric similar to almost like a drum in a, in a way mm, like a big uh, tarp around it yeah and it's it's shrunk it has coatings on it so it's it's not like you're gonna you know puncture it but technically it's a lightweight uh structure for flying it uh, airplanes are still made with it today but it's a uh, it was what they had back in the day 1946. Wow, crazy. Um, what, what's a what's like a Cessna 172? Like, what are the costs of some of like these maybe more standard planes that 
folks yeah. going on. I have Great no reference. <laughs> so I guess the interesting fact is um, back in you know, the 1930s, um, as a whole, we figured out a whole lot about aerodynamics and plane designs. Um, and if you look at most piston single engine aircraft, they all look very similar. Um, you know, wing, tail, uh, we, we, we figured out a whole lot back then. So like a 172 or a 170 was originally made in the 1940s. Um, and that's, it's not identical, but very similar overall to the same plane that a Cessna makes today. Um, and most of these airplanes have been maintained well. They're made of, out of aluminum. Uh, so there is some corrosion issues, but they don't, they don't rust away. Um, so there's really a massive spectrum in, you know, a 172, a brand new one is, uh, expensive. I mean, uh, uh probably 400,000. Mm. Uh, most people aren't buying new aircraft. Uh, you go all the way back to the fifties and you're probably, uh, talking in the, it's changed a little bit with like the recent economy, but you know, in the 20, $30,000 range. Uh, so, so it's kind of interesting. A lot of times when you buy an aircraft, um, especially an older aircraft, they hold their value pretty well. Most of the cost is just in upkeep, hangar, maintenance, insurance. Um, yeah. They tend to hold values pretty stably. Cool. No, we'll, we'll get into that. I, we'll talk about hangar costs here. You know, yeah. costs to actually fill up the thing. <laughs> um, so no, that, that, that's like great background, uh, good reference point. So uh, so you're in high school, you're going through this process, you're, you're getting certification, you're kind of, you know, kind of building that repertoire, or I don't know what you call it, but um, being able to fly bigger, faster planes. Yeah. Um, and then in college, you mentioned you had a summer job where you're flying a private jet. Yeah. Uh, and this is a great story. Um can you talk about it's a, a company jet? I think you you were a pilot for while you're in high school. Yeah, yeah, in college. college. Yeah, so I was actually a, a co-pilot on it, but mm -hmm. um, it was for a it was actually for a prison healthcare company. Mm -hmm. um, so they had a very unique need, which I think a lot of people with corporate aircraft do. Is you know if, where some of their locations were were in remote areas of Texas and Arkansas, Missouri. Um, so if they were making trips to these, these, these airports, you know, going out of, you know, Alabama, you'd have to, you know, drive to Birmingham, catch a flight to Atlanta, catch a flight to, um, you know, somewhere else and then connect somewhere else in Texas and then drive for two hours. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, versus in a corporate aircraft, the whole flight would take two hours there, two hours back, you were home for dinner. Uh, so like the economics of it made a lot more sense in their specific case. Um, but yeah, actually just like I said, I kind of grew up at, at the airport and had the opportunity to do that in college. And, you know, you learn, you kind of get your licenses, but then you, you you're, there's also a lot of learning there as well. Um, so yeah, it was, it was always funny. Some of my friends were always jealous because they were, you know, sitting in cubes and their summer internships doing, you know, be lookups. And I was, you know, I would like send them a picture at eight o'clock in the morning overlooking the Chicago skyline. And then, so, but, but it, it was a really neat experience. Learned a lot along the way. And um, also realized things, you know, I didn't necessarily want to do, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the challenges of being a pilot in general is your, your whole career is going places. Um, you know, there's always a lot of travel um, and challenges around that. And maybe that wasn't the, the path I wanted, um, so I ended up being able to just kind of fly some little airplanes on my own and, and have enjoyed doing that. So as, as you're uh, a, a college student, you pick up this job to fly the CEO of, of a company around with a, uh, as a co-pilot. Did ever, anyone ever look at you and like, wait a minute, you're, you're, you're a bigger guy. You have a beard. I don't have a beard. So maybe <laughs> you didn't get, get those looks that, you know, I still get, but uh, anyone ever say, why is there a 20 year old like flying me around? Yeah, I actually started with, with, when I was uh, 19. So it, it was a lot better when I turned 20 because then I could say I was in my early 20s. Um, <laughs> uh, so that was that was helpful. Um, I didn't have the beard back then, so I didn't look quite as old. Um, I think the funniest part of it is it, at the time you have to be 25 to rent a car. So technically you can you can fly, you know, uh, somebody's $10 million jet. 
uh, be part of, you know, flying it to a place. And then all of a sudden you get there and like, oh, we can't trust you with a Corolla. And you're like, oh, man. <laughs> so it's, it's funny how that works. No Uber back then. Yeah. <laughs> and what kind of plane was this? I want to look it up. Yeah. So this was a Cessna CJ3. Let's see what this looks like. Um, I know nothing about planes except I want to, you know, sit in business class. So one of these guys. Okay. Pretty cool. Here it is. Yep. So two pilots. Uh, you can fit up to eight passengers, more like four or five passengers comfortably. Um, it cruises about about 460 miles an hour wow um, how far yeah. how far does a plane like this go in one tank yeah it depends a lot on winds uh if i remember correctly it was right around like, i think like 1300 nautical miles um so you could usually do like uh birmingham to like albuquerque you get to denver um you couldn't quite do coast to coast um mm -hmm. you you could get close if you were going you know west to east with a big tailwind but usually there was a stop in the middle but most of our trips were east of the mississippi so it it was you know made sense uh range wise wild yeah. uh and so will uh, i have a question so i've flown a lot for work and um just being a consultant you know always on a plane um and i've always found it interesting that uh, some trips are faster than others uh, you know, probably a lot of that has to do with the, the winds, if you can talk about that. Uh, but I asked a question, I remember this on Cora, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago. Uh, and it really about like, how fast can a commercial airline, you know, plane go? And why don't they go that fast all the time? <laughs> like, is there a speed limit in the air? That's really what I want to know. Yeah. A um, couple things to unpack there. Um, so in general, there's a jet stream that moves from west to east. And I wish I could say I was, you know, meteorologist level of weather expertise. I'm good enough to get by. Um, there's generally a jet stream that moves from west, west to east. That jet stream generally lowers uh, during the winter. Um, so usually that wind's stronger. Uh, you know, it's more helpful if you're going eastbound, less helpful if you're going westbound. So um, it lower as in it's not as intense or uh, it's like actually, actually lower down. So yeah, it moves southerly. Uh, uh, okay. So Comes down. Yeah. But kind of moves more over the States uh, in the winter time versus in the summer. Um, and then, so that, that's one part of it. Um, another part that has a lot to do with flight time is um, I would say one with the weather's like at your airport. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a, you know, a visual day, um, towers and air traffic control can much more easily route aircraft into an airport. Um, they can, you know, there's more visual separation that air, airplanes can use. So you can see and avoid other aircraft uh, versus when it's, you know, super bad weather, airplanes are all, you know, getting kind of crammed together and everybody has to kind of land one at a time. Um, fly approaches, that slows everything down. Um, so that can add to a trip. And then also sometimes winds just have an effect. You know, you think about um, the Atlanta airport, for example, with an east-west runway. Uh, if you take off in the direction you're going, you save a chunk of time uh, just by not having to go opposite one way and then double back. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have to go 10 minutes the wrong way for air traffic, then you have to, you know, catch that 10 minutes going back the other. Uh, so all those factors uh, kind of go together. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, corporate aircraft tend to fly higher than airliners. Um, mm -hmm. So also there's a lot more traffic in the like 32,000 to low 30,000 range. Um, a lot of corporate aircraft are flying in the high 30s, low 40s. Some are even higher on the, the, the fancy corporate jets. Um, so what's interesting is in the corporate world, you can also get more like direct routes where sometimes the airliners have to take a little bit more um, designed routes just since there's more traffic there and there's probably some people that can explain that way better than i can but uh, no no i i love it so um when they're in the air i i've always found it interesting is we're 
getting to the gate before you know the time they said we could and now i have to wait at the gate uh because the the next plane hasn't left the gate yet it, it, does that have a lot to do with those conditions you talked about there or, uh, yeah sometimes like i said it's a whole whole system but sometimes i think some of the airlines have more slots that they can kind of fly in mm -hmm. uh you kind of if, if you kind of think they have a little bit of like a designated position in line so all of a sudden, if you get backed up or that plane can't leave because the weather's too bad where they're going, and then it kind of, you know, the whole system starts to delay. Um, so all those things can have an impact, obviously mechanical issues. And then sometimes the, you know, the pilot you need hasn't landed yet and uh, they haven't made it to their gate. And then, then there's somebody deadheading on that plane to go to catch another plane. So it's, it's a big, complicated system. And, you know, uh, most of the time it works out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, another uninformed question for me. Um, so when you're driving, you have you know, different lanes, you know, traffic's going this way, traffic's going the other way. Do we have that in the skies uh, or is everyone kind of all over the place? Just, you know, using radar, hoping not to hit each other. Yeah. Also a great question. Um, so there are a couple different options there. Um, back before, I'd say GPS was more widespread, just maybe 20 years ago. There are some more typical routes called Federal Airways that you can kind of, you can follow. Um, so they do typically keep traffic more in a line. Um, mm -hmm. And then especially at some larger airports, they have some procedures or routes you fly in, kind of like highways in the sky that start hundreds of miles out. Uh, mm -hmm. So they help getting everybody in sequence versus, I don't know if you remember when like iPhones came out, they had the air traffic control game and like everybody was showing up on your screen at the same time. Uh, instead, you know, they're, they're managing those airplanes hundreds of miles out to get them aligned. Um, outside of that, you also have, there's some general rules about altitudes. Um, so when you're flying uh, easterly, uh, you fly at odd altitudes when you're flying westerly, you fly at even altitudes. Mm -hmm. And then if your visual rules, you fly at five hundreds of feet. And then if you're IFR, which means kind of we go back to flying in the clouds, you're being controlled by air traffic control. Uh, you're flying at the, the exactly like 8,000, 9,000, 10,000. Um, and then there's some other rules for kind of airliners up above 18,000 feet, or flight level 180, but that gets a little bit more complex. <laughs> Uh, but in general, there is some guidance of separation uh, that you have. Um, it's also interesting back, you know, once again, you go back 10, 20 years ago, um, aircraft didn't quite have the same, some of the same technology that they have now. And much smaller aircraft, <laughs> if you weren't talking to air traffic control and other planes weren't talking to air traffic control, um, you weren't flying into like a large airport. It was a little bit more of a see and avoid call your position on a radio. Um, nowadays there's more advanced technology. We're literally on your iPhone or iPad um, right. and a Bluetooth connection to a device. You can see all the airplanes around you, their altitude, their airspeed. So it's gotten actually much safer. Um, funny enough, airplanes like that Piper cub you saw uh, don't even have an electrical system. Most of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you actually have to like hand crank it. You spin the propeller uh, and then there's no avionics inside of it. So you're not generating a signal outbound. You're not receiving a signal inbound. So you really are just, you know, up there seeing and avoiding. It's probably why it's all, they're all bright yellow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> amazing. There, there's so much in this world. Uh, it, it's amazing to hear here. Um, so, uh, well, I'd love to talk about um, kind of what you're flying today, but I think before that, you have to tell us about this plane you bought that someone built by themselves and that you bought <laughs> yeah. kind of a kit plane, a self a self made one. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. Um, <laughs> this one's always fun to explain. Um, so there's different certifications of aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, there's type certified aircraft which. Are, are built by a manufacturer. The design's been approved by the FAA. The build process has been approved by the FAA. Um, some of that's really good. Um, there are some downsides with cost around that. Um, you know, air, 
these manufacturers have to carry out a whole lot of insurance. Um, simple parts become really expensive. Um, and going back to kind of what we were talking about earlier, you know, a lot of this stuff we figured out around aircraft design and building process uh, was really evolved in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then our, the construction technique on aircraft, like I said, some of them are steel tube with a fabric covering. And then around World War II, they really, that's when really the design of uh, aluminum sheets with rivets became more prolific. Um, so it was like the simplest way to assemble aircraft quickly with people they were pulling in from the streets. Mm -hmm. So you think about how a Cessna is built, it's sheets of aluminum with holes. And then you mash a little uh, uh, a little metal tube, and it joins two sheets together. Um, so the process of that is actually pretty simple, um, but it's very time consuming. Uh, so what's kind of become more popular through the years is there's a number of kit manufacturers, and some of them are much more uh, kits than others. Um, but a lot of the components are engines are the same, really designs are sometimes inspired by certified aircraft that came before them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can end up, people end up building these aircraft. There's actually a large community of them. Um, they get built, flown um, by a lot of owners. Surprisingly enough, um, there's a company called Vans, which I had a Vans aircraft. Um, I had a Vans RV8. And there's actually more... Um, it, it gets like pretty close, but there's almost like more vans that people build a year than like Cessna's building 172s or or Cirrus is building aircraft. They're another popular aircraft manufacturer right now. Yeah, really? something like that. <laughs> That's awesome. So so you were you were flying this uh, type of plane uh, or aircraft, if you will. Um, what are the specs? How fast does this thing go? Can you do yep. aerobatics in it, which we'll talk about next? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a two-seat aircraft uh, tandem, so front and back. Uh, mm -hmm. This one, the pilot flies from the front. Uh, I forgot to mention earlier, but that Piper Cub you saw earlier, the pilot actually flies it from the back seat. Uh, so you can kind of see where you're going, but that's another story. <laughs> um, the Vans RV, it actually has the same engine as a 172, um, a Lycoming 360 cubic inch, 180 horsepower engine. Some of them have 200 horse, but uh, right around there. Um, so the fuel economy, um, it burns nine, 10 gallons an hour, same as a 172. But where a 172 cruises at about 120, 30 miles an hour, um, this aircraft cruises about 200 miles an hour. Um, so then you kind of start breaking it down and av gas is usually a dollar or two more than um, like premium car fuel. Um, but then you break it down if you're doing 200 miles an hour on nine, 10 gallons, uh, 10 gallons an hour, your miles per gallon is like 20 miles per gallon. So it's actually uh, trip wise. It's not, it's not terrible um, to run them. Uh, um, and then as far as aerobatics, um, mine had an inverted oil and fuel system. Uh, so <laughs> part of that is uh, you have to have some different systems in your aircraft so that fuel still gets the engine upside down and the engine still yeah. being rated. Um, and then it's stressed for plus six and minus three Gs. Um, so you can do most... Um, intermediate level aerobatic figures, rolls, loops, hammerheads, uh, inverted flight. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a really good all around aircraft, albeit, you know, you're not going to take the whole family in it unless, you know, it's just the two of you. <laughs> right. Right. Um, <laughs> I love all the terminology. We'll, we'll kind of, at the end, I'm going to ask you to teach me some lingo. So people think I know what I'm talking about here. Perfect. That's um, half the battle. Yes. <laughs> uh, and so you flew that Vans aircraft for a little bit. Um, and you recently, I think, uh, acquired a new aircraft. And that's where you're flying today. Yeah. So work, working on the new aircraft, mm -hmm. uh, probably trying to get back into flying aerobatics. Okay. Uh, so little background there. 
Um, so I, uh, around the same time, find the corporate jet in college. I actually had access to a, uh, uh, an aerobatic plane called an Extra 300. Uh, it's also a two-seat tandem aircraft. Uh, this one you also flew from the back seat again. Um, it's an Extra 300? Yes. Yeah, you're not making this stuff up. These... <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So if you see a picture of it, it actually looks very similar to a uh, first one's pretty close. Uh, it actually looks very similar to a Vans RV. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the differences is the wings actually made of a carbon fiber material. Um, so it's stressed to plus 10 minus 10 G's. Um, and it was tested well beyond those limits up to 20 G's. Uh, so, I mean, most fighter jets you think of are, you know, seven, eight, nine G aircraft, maybe negative two Gs. And this is going well past those limits. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, uh, going into G lock or, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, pulling a lot of negative Gs and it's, it's much more painful experience, uh, <laughs> much faster roll rate. Uh, and then the aircraft has 300 horsepower instead of 180. So much faster climb rate. Uh, much longer vertical lines, uh, just more performance all around. Uh, so so you had access to this plane as you were flying corporate uh, over the summer as a side gig, your internship essentially yeah. uh, during school. Um, what was the first stunt? Uh, this is a question from Instagram that you know you yeah. ever ever learned, and and how nervous were you? <laughs> yeah, so I, I'd probably flown a little bit of aerobatics here and there before. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually went up with an aerobatic pilot uh, when I was 10 years old. That's what I wanted to do for my 10th birthday. And somehow I got my mom to agree with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but first first aerobatic maneuver in that plane was just a, was just a roll. Um, mm. It's funny with an aircraft of that design. Um, it rolls... Uh, about 360 degrees per second, a little bit less, probably close to 300. But um, it really is as simple as, you know, you just pitch up just a little bit, push the stick over to the side, and you blink your eyes, and you're, you're right back upright again. So it's actually so pretty, just hitting it. It's pretty simple. It gets moving pretty quick. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so learned how to fly that aircraft. It was a little bit different uh, from aircraft I was coming from. Um, ended up getting a lot of training in it. And then there are these things called aerobatic contests. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's kind of a gateway to if you wanted to get into air show flying. Um, so there's different levels of these um, or different categories in an aerobatic contest. And these are all over the country. Um, there's probably close to one in every state, more or less. Um, and basically a whole bunch of aerobatic pilots from the area meet up. It's more of a, as much of a social event as a flying event. Um, and you, you have these predefined sequences you have and you go through and you fly your loops and rolls and uh, other maneuvers. And it's who can fly those more precisely than the other people in your group. And as you move up in those groups, it starts at a kind of beginner and then moves up uh, to unlimited. Uh, and as, as you move up, the airplane has to become more capable. The pilot has to become more capable. Um, the G's become much more significant. Uh, yeah. especially on the negative side. Uh, and uh, on that, Ben Ben wants to know, uh, have you ever passed out from the G-Force? Uh, never passed out. Uh, you do get some tunnel vision. Like mm -hmm. you, you can feel if you're pulling enough, you know, you, you can see kind of the uh, probably gray, starting to gray out just a little bit. <laughs> um, the, the big shift is if you ever go from, you know, uh, negative Gs, so you're pushing uh, on this on the stick, and you're more or less trying to get thrown outside the cockpit. So you have all the blood that goes up into your head, and then right after that, you pull a lot of positive G's, and just that blood all gets drained out really quickly. Uh, you have to really fight and you know uh, flex, uh, quench to you know keep the blood up in your head and and keep going. Much, Sounds like yeah. fun, doesn't it? Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just thinking of Top Top Gun here. Yeah, um, yeah, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and so, with the the aerobatic uh, you know, competitions you're doing, what what level are you at? Um, what does that look like for you? 
Yeah. So you're, you're flying in kind of a predefined imaginary box. Um, mm -hmm. Starting in the lower levels, the floor of the box is 1,500 feet above ground level. And then as you move on to tire categories, the bottom of that box gets lower. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not as low as like air show flying. That's a little bit different style, a little bit different. Uh, it's a pretty different thing from competition aerobatics. Uh, but aerobatic uh, competition aerobatics has a really, really good safety record. Um, you know, everybody is a safety forward culture. It's more about learning, you know, having fun than it is about, you know, proving who's the most macho, who can fly the lowest. That That's not the name of the game. It's really just yeah. kind of a, a process of getting better at flying and, you know, learning along the way. You uh, said there's different tiers to it. So like beginner up to ultimate. Uh, yeah. Where, you, where do you see yourself in that spectrum there? Yeah, I would like to... Uh, I, when I was flying, I was just getting into flying intermediate, which is the, mm -hmm. the third of the five levels. Um, I'd like to eventually get to advanced. Um, unlimited is a little bit different animal. Most mm -hmm. people like to say you have to have unlimited time and unlimited funds, uh, which I have neither. Uh, so maybe <laughs> maybe advanced is uh, you know the place I'd eventually like to get to. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and are there any stunts that you may be like refuse to do um, or, you know, the wife doesn't want you, you doing because uh, <laughs> they're maybe too dangerous. No, I mean, so what's, I guess what's kind of interesting is there's, you, you really fly the stunts that the aircraft's built for. Uh, so mm. like the, the stunts or aerobatics you could fly in that RV eight uh, are much different than the aerobatics you could fly in the extra. Um, so you got to stay within the G limits of the aircraft. Um, and then, you know, with with enough altitude, there's really nothing you can do that's going to hurt to hurt the airplane. Um, and as long as you stay conscious, so you're not going crazy on the G's, you, there's really not something that you're not going to be able to get it out of, whether it's a spin or a tumble um, or an unusual attitude. But in the uh, extra unusual in aircraft, you could you can tumble it really well. Um, and so what's you know, a tumble? People, yeah. So most people think about like. A stall is scary in an airplane, which just mm -hmm. means you're more or less not going fast enough to develop lift um, or as much lift so the airplane sinks. Where a tumble is when you, uh, it, the best way to put it is kind of like drifting a car. Mm -hmm. uh, so you basically got the wing to exceed like how the air can grip the wing. So then the airplane is more reliant on the gyroscopes of the engine and you're literally kind of skidding through the sky tumbling. Uh, cool. So it's, yeah, it's a whole different thing than what you'd ever do in an airline. Uh, you make sure your seatbelt's really tight uh, <laughs> before you start those. And, and when you're learning a new trick like this, are you going up and someone told you how to do it and you give it a try or you fly yeah. up with someone else and they kind of show you firsthand? Yeah, it, it's a balance. Um, so you learn a lot of the things that um, kind of the basics and then some of the more advanced aerobatics kind of put some of those basics together. Mm. Um, you do, you can kind of reach areas where the G limits are so high and it starts to get a little bit more violent flying them that nobody's going to want to ride with you to learn, to teach you how to do them. Uh, so a lot of times you learn some of the things like if something goes wrong, and wrong in like just a, you know, the airplane falls out of maneuver or um, stalls midway through. It's going to enter that same like unusual attitude, which you know how to recover from. A spin, whether it's upright or inverted, that you know how to recover from. Or a tumble, which you know how to recover from as well, which sometimes mm -hmm. decays into a spin. Um, so it's kind of like building up that toolbox uh, to then know how to handle the airplane flying aerobatics in different situations. Got it. it. It's a, a gradual process. I'm, I'm not going to learn how to do that on my second, you know, lesson that I, I've taken. This is building on top of it. Yeah, it's it's it, there's a there's a high level of <laughs> high barrier to entry mm. uh, to kind of get to that point. Um, but it is, is a lot of fun and, you know, a good way of kind of growth once you get there. Um, it's also just interesting, you know, big difference between flying airplanes and driving cars is, you know, in airplanes, there's no brakes. There, there is no brakes, not really. Um, 
So oh, yeah, no breaks. <laughs> yeah, I always tell people in interviews when it comes to projects and you know my kind of background in implementations. It's kind of like flying an airplane. Taking mm -hmm. off is optional. Starting your project is optional. Uh, you know, uh, landing is required. <laughs> uh, so you know, once you take off, you are committed to land at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're managing that combination of potential energy and kinetic energy and uh, throughout the flight, and especially aerobatics um until you're back on the ground so yeah and uh next i, I want to talk about um kind of the maintenance you know digging into hangers and all that um but first uh have you had any close calls uh while flying any any good scares yeah uh unfortunately or fortunately not depending on you know kind of how you look <laughs> at it um yeah. i always you know, I think it's important if you're flying, you know, well-maintained aircraft, you know, that cuts down on a lot of the risk. Um, a lot of the flying I enjoy doing is in the day, uh, visual flight conditions. Um, I never have to be anywhere, so don't need to fly in icing. Don't need to fly in thunderstorms. Don't need to fly over really hazardous terrain. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you start cutting out some of those risks, you know, that, that helps a lot there. Um, I had a couple of minor mechanical issues. The, the biggest one is probably a couple of times had more near misses with hitting another aircraft in the air. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Especially at non-controlled airports. You know, it goes back to some people are flying without using a radio, no electrical system. So that's that, that in some ways, that's probably the scariest one out of all of them. Yeah. You're, you're like a maverick and, the Russians are flying towards you. <laughs> so, something like that. <laughs> yeah, good, Overall, good, good timing on Top Gun coming out today. Well, well scheduled. Yes, thank you, thank you. This will be out next week, but it'll be fresh <laughs> in everyone's memory. Um, all right, so uh, owning a plane. What what does it look like to to really own a plane? You have to store it, maintain it. What what's all the effort that goes into it? Is it uh, you know how they talk about boats. The happiest day is, is when you buy it, and, and then when you sell it. So, um, what what are the real costs that go into owning and maintaining a, an aircraft? Yeah, that that's fair. Um, it's a little bit different from a boat. Um, there's really five main things that go into kind of owning an airplane. Um, well, well, I guess we'll first start off with you know just purchasing the aircraft. You know, if you purchase a new aircraft, no different than I would kind of relate it to owning like a exotic car. Mm. Um, if you went out and bought a new Ferrari or Lamborghini or something, you know, there's probably going to be massive depreciation, right? Um, if you end up purchasing, you know, a 20 year old aircraft, which is same design, same, everything as a new aircraft, more or less. Um, it's going to take out almost all the depreciation of it. Um, especially if you go back a little further, 30 years, which is a large part of the general aviation fleet. Mm -hmm. um, from there, you kind of have five main costs to owning an aircraft. Um, you're going to have storage, which you can keep an aircraft outside or in a hangar. Um, and there's all, a lot of that depends on where you live. If you're in a big metro area like Atlanta, um, hangars are a few hundred dollars a month. Um, at some more rural airports, you're probably closer to like $150 a month. Mm. Uh, and then if you want to store your aircraft outside, it's even cheaper, um, less than $100 a month. Um, from there, you also have insurance on your aircraft. Uh, most people want to insure the whole of their aircraft. You could just get away with liability. Um, <laughs> and that has a large range on the uh, you know, the cost of the aircraft, your experience, um, and then just the make and model as well. Um, so that can be in the range of, you know, $1,000 a year. Uh, maintenance varies. You have to have your aircraft inspected every 12 calendar months um, mm -hmm. by a certified mechanic that maintains it according to the FAA's policies. Um, just for the inspection on small aircraft or maybe $1,000. And then plus what could be wrong with it. Um, and then you also have taxes, which vary state by state, property taxes. Uh, and then you have fuel. So it's usually, usually a good rule of thumb is if you're flying about 100 hours a year and these aircraft like to fly times your hour gallons per hour 
times the cost of the fuel. Um, so you might have a, a few thousand dollars there. And obviously these costs can have massive swings based on, you know, if you're looking at buying a Gulf stream, uh, you know, you're going to burn, you know, 500 gallons an hour, you know, pick the number. All of a sudden those costs go up substantially and, you know, insurance, maintenance, taxes, um, that's a whole different thing. But um, some aircraft you could purchase old vintage aircraft, probably not much more than a used car. Um, and then you're talking, depending on location, other things would, you know, um, be less than a thousand dollars a month to own, maybe closer to 500. Some could be, and then, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, so it is, it's not a cheap hobby by any means. Um, but it's also, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's also, I think, uh, a balance of, you know, where your priorities are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've, some people probably spend more than that on a car or other things. Um, uh, I, I, I unfortunately have the aviation bug, so it goes into an airplane. Uh, yeah. No, that, that's awesome. Um, and so where have you taken your plane? I, I know, uh, you'll take it to the beach. Um, yeah. so can you talk about just like how, how you're using the plane and, uh, for, for leisure and, and not acrobatics? Yeah. I, I wish I could say that, you know, it was, uh, I have a great mission, but not always, uh, <laughs> a lot of times, um, uh, sometimes they're just weekend trips. Um, you know, you start looking at the South Carolina coast is uh, about an hour and 45 minutes away. Uh, Gulf of Mexico is about two hours away. You can get down to parts of Florida pretty quick. Um, you can also get up to the Northeast in about three, three and a half hours. Um, so you can, you know, you can use it for those kind of trips. Uh, a lot of the uses are just, um, you know, going to meet up with other people that fly airplanes. So sometimes you're meeting somewhere for breakfast or <laughs> somebody will have a fly in somewhere. Uh, so everybody will meet up and hang out. Somebody will bust out a grill and, you know, cook out. Um, and there's another, con a, a number of conventions around. Um, so kind of weekend destinations where you'll have, uh, there's one in South Carolina that'll have, you know, 200, 250 people fly in for a few days, uh, camp out. And then there's one big aviation convention up in Wisconsin every year, and they'll have 10,000 planes fly in. It's the busiest airport in the world for that week. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a whole convention, air show. Uh, so it's kind of just a fun community of meeting people and something to do. So That's neat. Uh, is there like Facebook groups you're part of? Like... WhatsApp group chats. How does everyone communicate here? Yeah. So uh, a lot of Facebook groups, especially when you dive into like specific aircraft make and models, um, about every type of aircraft has its own Facebook group. Um, there's also, you know, aviation is a little bit of an old school crowd. Uh, so there's a lot of like little clubs that send out, you know, bi-monthly magazines mm -hmm. uh, and have these like email groups. Uh, it kind of depends on like what you want to get involved in in aviation. Um, some people love, you know, Cessnas and want to take trips with their family. Some people really love vintage aircraft and restoring and building aircraft. Some people are really into warbirds, aerobatics. There's a whole glider community. So there's really a lot of different places where people have different interests and they kind of group and congregate and have their own uh, kind of community there. I feel, I feel like there's a startup in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the running joke in aviation is if you ever want to make a million dollars in aviation, start with two. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's see here. Well, uh, I, I think those are all the questions that I wanted to go through. Maybe, maybe two last things to wrap up here. You know, what are, you know, from your point of view, maybe some of the misconceptions about uh flying you know small smaller aircrafts obviously my mom doesn't want me to get in one but um you <laughs> yeah. know i'm sure you, you hear that a lot and, and so you know what are your thoughts on that how do you address kind of comments like that yeah i i think that's you know uh, a fair thing i've grown up around it so it's much more um you know something i'm much more used to I think from a risk profile you can slice and dice the numbers it is a little bit more dangerous than driving um, I think if you start looking at it as like a per mile basis, it gets more safe and you can start going faster, 
gets safer. Um, you know, per hour basis, it's it's more dangerous. Um, so th there is some factor there. I think you know the goal is to make it as safe as possible. Um, obviously, I wouldn't want to get an airplane just you know, and that'd be the last time I fly. You know, that's <laughs> that's never the goal. So you you approach it approach it with a very you know uh, safety conscious mindset, um, ability to learn, take feedback. Um, and keep developing your skills, which I think is why a lot of people kind of get get in deep into it. It's just because it's uh, you keep learning. There's there's a lot to learn. Um, and I think the other thing um, is that aviation is much more accessible than I think a lot of people think it is. Mm. Um, you know, it's especially if you're not in a huge suburban area. Even if you are, um, you can find a local flight school go for a uh, just like a demo training flight it's it's usually a couple hundred bucks um, but you'll go you'll go fly in the airplane they'll let you fly some see what it's like if you have more interest um, there's ways to get it done in a more cost effective manner and once you have your license um, it doesn't require a, a, a huge sum of money to keep it up um, mm. the only requirement is that occasionally you fly so many takeoff and landings. Um, but once you have your pilot certificate, you have it for life. Um, oh, wow. Even if it expires, you can go up and fly three touch and go landings and you're you're back in business to take your friends flying. I, I, it's probably good to get some training if it's been a long time, but <laughs> but that's that's kind of the process. And 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 you know, if, even if you have your license, you can rent still rent aircraft and uh, it, make it a you know much more cost effective endeavor. Um, kind of owning an aircraft is a uh, is a labor of love, to say the least. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, all right, let's wrap up here. Will um, teach us some lingo. How can I sound like I know what I'm talking about here? Because I clearly don't. Yeah, that that's fair enough. Um, let's see. Do you want to do you want to like be able to talk to another pilot? Or do you want to walk through the, the airport, you know, hard steel, like, like, you know what you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, I, I, well, how do I talk to air traffic control and how do I impress a pilot to the point where they ask me if I know what I'm talking about? Oh, that's fair. Um, yeah. I would say the biggest thing when you talk to like air traffic control or a lot of the lingo you hear, mm -hmm. uh, if you ever really want to get good at it, there's a couple of websites that constantly record um, like the conversations between air traffic control and the pilots. And some of those are uh, some controllers like in New York are much sassier than others, but it, that's besides the point. Um, but yeah, I think it starts with just knowing like the different parts of the airport. Uh, so know like where the airplanes are is typically called a ramp. Um, you taxi on a taxiway, you take off on a runway. Um, it's also good to know the... Uh, it's the military alphabet, the Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. It's how it's always referenced. Um, and then if you can learn the different call signs of the different airlines. Uh, mm. So, you know, Delta, um, Delta Flight, American, there's Cactus. There's all these call signs for the different airlines. So if you learn those, you'll probably, you know, you'll know most of the lingo from there. Love it. Um... Awesome. Well, this has been so fun. I appreciate you taking the time here to to explain kind of this whole aviation world. Um, I still think you owe me a flight to the beach. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll make that happen one day. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it, man. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, for those who, who made it this far, I, I appreciate you watching and uh, enjoying the content. Um, if you have questions for Will, leave them in the, the comments. Uh, I'll make sure he responds to them. Um, if there's any other topics you want me to talk about or interview, please let me know. Um, but until then, really appreciate everyone's time. And of course, yours will. Um, really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks so much.